In this example, we are given an AC voltage source and a resistor, capacitor, and inductor connected in series with that AC voltage source. Since the AC voltage source is given to us in phasor form, we will assume that we're in steady state and thus a phasor solution to the problem will be appropriate. So, to begin, we'll take a look at part A. And what are we asked to find in part A? Draw the voltage vector diagram for the circuit. It's always a good idea when we are working with circuits that have reactants to start thinking about the problem by thinking about vector diagrams. And in this case, we are asked to draw the voltage vector diagram. Now, the reason for that is we look at our circuit, it's a series circuit, we ask ourselves what circuit variable is common to all the components. And since it's a series circuit, we remember that it's the current that's the same or common to all the components in the series circuit. So we will use the total current flowing through the series circuit as our reference vector and draw it on the horizontal axis like that. Now, next, uh, we look at the resistor, and we know that for the resistor, the current through the resistor and the voltage across the resistor are in phase, and for that reason we will draw the voltage now across the resistor along the same axis as our reference vector. Next for the capacitor, we will draw this vector 90 degrees lagging the current because we know that for a capacitor voltage lags current by 90 degrees. Next thinking about the inductor, we know that for the inductor voltage leads current by 90 degrees and so the inductor voltage is drawn as a vector that is leading current by 90 degrees. Now this is our preliminary voltage vector diagram and that's because we haven't solved for any of these values yet so we don't know what relative lengths to include here and so this is as far as we can go on part A. For part B we are asked to find what is the total impedance Z seen by the voltage source. So let's write down what we are given that applies here and I see that we have R is equal to 120 ohms. We have C is 10 microfarads which we will write as 10 times 10 to the minus 6 farads and we have an inductance L 50 millihenries which we will write as 50 times 10 to the minus 3 henries. And we are asked to find Z the total impedance seen by the voltage source. So in other words, to the right of the voltage source, what is the impedance? And now let's write down what we know. In other words, what is the relationship that we can find between these given values and this unknown value that we're asked to find? Well, we know that Z for a series RCL circuit, series only, Z is equal to the square root of R squared plus x sub l minus x sub c squared. And that reminds us we'll have to find x sub l and x sub c, so let's write those down as well. x sub l is 2 pi f l, and x sub c is 1 over 2 pi f c, and that will give us all the information we need to find the impedance here. So to begin the solution, we'll have to find x sub l and x sub c so we can plug those into this relationship for z that we're trying to solve for. So x sub l is 2 times pi times frequency. I guess we should include that in our given information. Frequency is 400 hertz. So 2 times pi times 400 hertz times the inductance was 50 times 10 to the minus 3 henrys. And that's going to give us, so we have 2 times 400 is 800, times 50 is 40,000, that's 40 times 10 to the third, so the 10 to the third cancels this 10 to the minus third, and I simplify this to 40 pi ohms, or approximately 125.7 ohms. 
Now, I prefer to work in phasor form. Uh, if you don't work in phasor form, you'll have to solve for the angle separately. Remember, this formula is only giving us the magnitude of the impedance and not the phase angle. And so since we know that we have both resistances and reactances in the circuit, the actual impedance is going to be uh, some magnitude with an angle somewhere between uh, 0 and plus or minus 90 degrees. And so I'm going to write this as X of L is equal to 0 plus J 125.7. Ohms. And I'll put that into my calculator that way. Um, if you have a different calculator, make sure you know how to work efficiently with your calculator to get things into phasor form as I've done here. This is in polar form and uh, your calculator may be in rectangular form. Either way, I've got the polar form of the uh, inductive reactants here in my calculator now. Next, I will find the capacitive reactants and that's going to be 1 over 2 times pi times 400 times 10 times 10 to the minus 6 all under 1 and when I do that I get approximately 2 times 400 is 800 times pi And I get 39.8 ohms, which once again I'm going to put in phasor form. We know that's going to be negative, and there I have it in, in phasor form. Now we're in a position to find the magnitude of the impedance as the square root of, now we had r squared and our r was given as 120 ohms squared plus the difference between the uh, reactances. So we've got uh, 125.7 minus 39.8 and we're going to square that and then take the square root and when I do that we're finding the magnitude of Z, I get approximately 147.6 ohms. Now that's just the magnitude of Z. I also need to find the angle expressing Z as a complex impedance. I think earlier I mistakenly referred to it as a phasor. Of course the impedance is not a phasor, it's a complex impedance, but not a phasor. It doesn't represent a rotating vector and it's not a representation of a sine wave so it's just a complex impedance. So I can find the angle theta as the arc tangent of x sub l minus x sub c over r and that's going to be the arc tangent of about 85.87 over 120 and when I did that I got about 35.59 degrees. So then we can draw an impedance triangle. Now we weren't asked to do this, but it's instructive. And this angle here is about 35.59 degrees. We've got the difference between the reactances. The inductive reactants is more than the capacitive reactants. And so this is the difference between the two and inductive reactants dominates. And so we've got about 85.87 ohms here. And we've got our magnitude here of 147.6 ohms and we had 120 ohms down here for the resistor and that's our that's our impedance complex impedance triangle so in complex impedance form I can write this as Z is equal to 120 plus J 85.87 or in polar form I can write that as 147.6 at an angle of 35.59 degrees and these are in ohms and that's what we were asked to find. For part B. Now for part C we are asked to find the current through the capacitor. Now the current through the capacitor here is the same as the total current since it's a series circuit it's the same current. So if we just find the total current 
then we will automatically have the current through the capacitor. So we're asked to find current through the capacitor, and we're given the results from part A. Here's where we found the impedance, and then here is the voltage source, which I've rewritten in polar form. And so what do we know? In other words, can we find a relationship between the given and the unknown information? And of course, we can use Ohm's law in phasor form, which is going to be uh, the current that we are seeking. And I've put the total current, since it's the same as the capacitive current, is equal to the voltage divided by the impedance. So we're in a position now to solve part C. And we'll write that the current in phasor form is equal to 220 at an angle of 0 degrees divided by our impedance, and we'll use the polar form here, 147.6 at an angle of 35.59 degrees, and that's volts over ohms, and that will be current, and I get about... 1.49, that will be in amps, uh, at an angle of negative 35.59. And that's in amps. And that's what we were asked to find for part C. Now for part D, we're asked to calculate the voltage across each component. Now I'm going to illustrate one approach here where we're just going to redraw the circuit. So I've redrawn the circuit. Notice that for the capacitor and for the inductor, I've redrawn those as just black boxes here to indicate that I'm really only interested in their reactance here. And what I've lost is I've lost all of their phase information. But that's okay because I have the phase information for the impedance when I solved for the, the complex impedance here in part C. And then also I've redrawn the vector from part A, which gives us relationships between the voltage across the inductor, across the capacitor, and across the resistor. So I'll use that to interpret what my results mean. What we're after here is we're after the voltage across the resistor, the voltage across the capacitor, and the voltage across the inductor. What are we given? Well, we're given results from previous parts, so I'll just write we're given I, and we know X sub C, and we know X sub L, and we know the resistance R. And we have those values here on my diagram. And we are asked to find the voltage across the resistor, the voltage across the capacitor, and the voltage across the inductor. I'm working here with just the magnitudes, so I haven't used the phasor symbol because I'm just going to work with the magnitudes. I already know the phase relationships from my previous work. So I know that Ohm's law applies at every individual component at all times, and so I will use that for our solution. First, for the voltage across the resistor, and I'm working with just the magnitude here, I will have the magnitude of the current, so I, times the resistance, and that's going to be 1.49 amps times 120 ohms. And now notice I'm writing down in my intermediate results, I'm writing down a number that's rounded off, but in my calculator I'm maintaining my full accuracy and resolution of the calculator. You should use your calculator in such a way to maintain the full accuracy of your calculator. And even though I may write down intermediate results rounded, I'm not using those rounded results in subsequent calculations, and so I'm maintaining maximum accuracy. So in my calculator, I get approximately 1.49 178.9, and that will be volts. Then for the capacitor, I have the voltage across capacitor is I times the capacitive reactance, which I have here. So that's going to be 1.49 amps times 
eight ohms, and that will be fifty nine point three volts, and then thirdly, for the inductor. I can calculate that as the series current times the inductive reactance, and that's going to be about 1.49 amps times 125.7 ohms, and that will be approximately 187.4 volts. So these are the values that I was asked to find for part D. Now to interpret what that means, let's look at a couple of things. First of all, you might observe that if I add up these values, uh, we get way more than the applied voltage. Applied voltage is 220 volts, yet if we add up these values, we'll see that we get over 400 volts. And so we might wonder how we can end up with more voltage in this loop than is applied. And the reason is because these voltages are out of phase, as indicated by our voltage vector diagram. In other words, the voltage across the inductor is larger, much larger, than the voltage across the capacitor. And these are 180 degrees out of phase. So the 59.3 volts across the capacitor will cancel part of the inductive voltage, 187.4 volts. In fact, subtracting the 59.3 volts across the capacitor from the 187.4 volts across the inductor, we get about 128 volts, and it will be positive 128 volts, so it will be at, the circuit is acting inductively. The inductance dominates. We could write a voltage triangle then, and we would have here the difference between the two reactive voltages, and we found that to be about 128 volts. Across the resistor here, we said we had 178.9 volts. And we know that our total applied voltage was 220 volts. And our angle here will be 35.59. We can get that from the impedance, 35.59 degrees. Now, for part E, we're asked to find the true apparent and reactive power delivered by the source and draw the power triangle. So, for part E, so first, as usual, we'll write down what we're given, and we have current, we have the voltage that's applied, and we have the impedance, and we're asked to find Power. Now I'm going to find the apparent power, which I'm calling S. I'll find it as a phasor. Your book calls it P sub APP, but we're going to find it as a phasor. And what do we know? Well, we have several relationships that we know between current, voltage, and impedance. We could use uh, current squared times the impedance, and we have those values. Or we could use the voltage squared divided by the impedance. We have those values. And we have current times voltage is the power. And let's use that one since it seems to be the simplest in this case. So I'll find the apparent power in phasor form by multiplying the current in phasor form and the voltage in phasor form. So we'll have S is equal to the current, which we have up here from part C. That's, that's about 1.49 at an angle of negative 35.56 degrees, and that's in amps, times the voltage 220 at zero degrees, and that's in volts, and I get 328 volt amps at an angle of negative 35.59 degrees. 
328 at an angle of negative 35.56 degrees. Now, if I put that in uh, rectangular form, I can get the real part, which is the part of the power that's dissipated by the resistor, and also I can get the reactive, the VARS, which is the power that's swapped back and forth between the power supply and our circuit in volt amps reactive. So I'm going to write this now in rectangular form. And I get in rectangular form 266.7 minus J190.9. That will be in volt amps. We have watts here and we have vars here. And that's what we were asked to find. Let's draw the power triangle. And the angle here is negative 35.5 We'll go with 9 degrees. Here for power we have 266.7 watts. That's the true power dissipated by the resistor, 266.7. And then we have the apparent power here, 328 volt amps. And then here we have the reactive power, that's negative 190.9 VAR. So here's our power triangle, and that's what we were asked to find for part E.